Good evening. Over Summerlink, we've seen from key parts of scripture that God is concerned to bless people of all nations, all people groups, through Abraham's offspring. We saw that with Peter in Genesis 12. We saw he'd bless through a king in Psalm 72, who rescues amid judgment in Isaiah 62 and 63. And this great king, Jesus, had to explain his plan for his slow learners on Resurrection Sunday in Luke 24. That this has always been God's plan, that everyone across the world should hear of these blessings of forgiveness and peace offered by God through Jesus. We saw in Acts 15 that sometimes God's people tie the enjoyment of these blessings too tightly to a particular culture or way of doing things, rather than seeing these blessings are enjoyed in a truly multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-everything kind of way, as people of all kinds of backgrounds are united in the risen King Jesus, as we saw with Mitch in Ephesians 3. And last week in Psalm 19, we were reminded that God has revealed himself through his world. What God has made is speech from God, the creator. In Romans 1 terms, it shows us his divine power, his eternal power and divine nature. But we need more than this to know our creator and enjoy his blessings, as Etienne showed us last week. And so we have his spoken word through which he tells us about himself, through which he points to the word made flesh. Jesus, the Messiah, coming, dying and rising again and sending out proclaimers of his forgiveness and blessings across the world to all kinds of people, even to us here. And we need this word written down in a language we can understand. Gareth and Catherine in Nigeria helped us see something more of this together, all that it involves. But we don't just need God's written word. We need speakers of the word as well and partners of word speakers, which is our focus this week. And the basis for some of the questions that you've been looking at earlier and where we've been heading all summer link, really. Uh, Let's turn to Romans 1 to see more of this under our first heading. Personally, be unashamed of gospel proclamation. Personally, be unashamed of gospel proclamation. Uh, Look down at chapter 1, verses 14 to 17, again with me. Paul writes, I'm under obligation, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to foolish. So I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it's written, the righteous shall live by faith. Paul says he's under obligation to preach the gospel to all kinds of people, Greeks and barbarians. That is Greeks and non-Greek speakers to the wise and to the foolish. And from Acts, we see Paul doing this around the eastern Mediterranean, in Damascus, Antioch, Lystra, Philippi, Athens, Corinth and Ephesus, from his conversion in Acts 9 onwards. And Paul's Acts context helps us as we think about Romans, as we touched on in the last few weeks, looking at Acts 15 and what happened in Ephesus as well. Paul is probably writing this letter to the Romans from Corinth in around Acts 20, with all that's going on there in the background. That's in going on in his mind as he puts pen to paper to these Roman Christians. Uh, but why does he do all this preaching? Well, because he's unashamed of the gospel, he says in verse 16, doesn't he? Look down at it. Uh, why so? Because it's the power of God to save everyone who believes, Jew and Gentile, slave and free, rich and poor, young and old, male and female, wise and foolish. That was Jesus' commission to him back in Acts chapter 9. He's under obligation to this king, Jesus, because he's received and benefited from this good news himself. Paul has gone round the eastern Mediterranean talking to people about God's momentous news that a new king, Jesus the Messiah, not Caesar, is in town. This king was promised long ago and fulfills God's promises, as we see in chapter 1, verses 1 to 6. And just as Jesus himself said in Luke 24, back in our first week of Summerlink, which just as an aside, also helps us refute the idea that Paul made up Christianity 
which pops up now and again in everyday thinking of atheists, Muslim people and others. Paul and Jesus agree and with the previous prophets that came before they were all leading up to Jesus, as Paul says. And this King Jesus will return to judge. Paul has told his hearers that in Athens in Acts 17, just like Isaiah promised, as we saw with, with Tom, as we saw a couple of weeks ago. But Jesus now gives people the opportunity to be safe on Judgment Day, which Paul told the Philippian jailer in Acts 16. Paul is unashamed of his king and this momentous news. It's the power to save all kinds of people from philosophers in Athens to a jailer in Philippi. I don't know the kind of things that that you talked about on your tables about what hinders you from speaking about King Jesus and this good news. But one for me is that it doesn't seem particularly powerful or wise. Much of my time is around Saleti Muslim people in Tower Hamlets. There are around 80,000 there and they don't seem to be being saved. And they usually think the idea of God's son dying for sin is pretty foolish. First, God can't have a son. Second, God can't die. And third, someone can't pay for someone else's sins. And so talking about Jesus with them and with anyone else, to be honest, makes me feel stupid. Not least if people don't do a Philippian jailer and say, good sir, what must I do to be saved? Uh, Talking about Jesus feels foolish and powerless, embarrassing, shameful even. But I need to remember it's wise and powerful for those who believe. It's the power of salvation for everyone who believes, not for everyone, regardless of what they think. Just like Paul said in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 22 onwards, echoing verses 14 and 15 here in chapter 1 of Romans. While Greeks demand wisdom, wise words, uh, Jews wanted powerful signs, miracles. But Paul preached King Jesus crucified, which was a stumbling block to both Jews and Greeks. But it's actually the power and wisdom of God. And so he didn't worry what people thought about it, and nor should I. And whether or not it has a powerful impact in people's lives, I should still talk about Jesus because he's worth it. Uh, Later on in Romans, Paul is clear the gospel doesn't save everyone. Uh, Not every Jew is part of God's people and not every Gentile is drawn into God's people. He shows us that in chapters 9 to 11 of Romans. But he concludes that section by saying everything is for God's glory whether salvation or judgment, creation or covenant, all are to show how great God is. Indeed, one big theme of the Bible could be said to be God's glory in salvation through judgment. As many of you have seen in the Bible overview, uh, small group studies over the last year, and as we saw in Isaiah too, a couple of weeks ago. And this desire for God's glory, God's greatness, God's godness to be known, his character, drives Paul on, as it did in Athens, in Acts 17, for example, where Paul was moved by the idols there to have a righteous indignation that what was rightfully God's worship was being given elsewhere to idols. And in some sense, Paul is an example to us in this. He says that again in in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, that he's an example to believers They should copy him as he copies Christ in giving his all so that some might be saved, Jews and Greeks. Which all helps us understand what's going on in Paul's mind as he writes Romans here, again, probably from Corinth in Acts 20. And after he spent some time in Athens amongst the idols. So like Paul, we too should have a similar lack of shame and feel a similar kind of obligation before we look in more detail about this, we need to back up just a few steps. Why do we need this gospel, this momentous news at all? In Psalm 19, we saw that we need God's word to reveal his character. Creation alone can't do this. But worse than this, creation tells us things about God that we try to to suppress, to put down in our hearts, and it makes us worthy of judgment. That's what the rest of Romans 1 tells us. And we should be on the other side of the handout if you're not there already, just to follow along. Uh, We're not going to look at it in detail, but you can go to the small group studies in Romans in the autumn to find out more. But the rest of Romans 1, into the middle of chapter 3, 
emphasises the predicament of all people everywhere and why we need the gospel in the first place. Everyone is under the wrath of God, says verse 18. Why? Because everyone has seen truths of creation, of Psalm 19, that there is a God who should be worshipped, but everyone has suppressed those truths. Rather than worship the one true God, we turn to follow made up gods, be they named gods of, of, of religions, formal religions, or less formally named gods like career and relationships, uh, money, power, comfort, uh, escapism, more or less anything that can occupy our hearts and direct our lives. Rather than believe truths about God, we believe lies. Rather than make God the one we follow, we follow our own desires and idols. That's chapter 1, verse 18 to 23 of Romans in particular. Now, there's no human solution to this, including religious works. Not even works of the God-given law can rescue us. No, only the gospel of Jesus Christ can rescue us, can rescue all kinds of people from their sins and the wrath that it provokes. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ can provide the great blessings of justification, of righteousness, of peace, of life, of relationship with God, of hope for the future, of certain life beyond the grave. As Romans chapters 3 to 8 show us, and Peter showed us in week 2 of Summerlink from Genesis 12 as well. That's Paul's great gospel conviction. That's why Paul is unashamed of this gospel. And that's at least chapters one to eight of Romans two. It's a defence of what he says, of what Paul says to the nations around the Mediterranean and what it achieves for them. And that should bring us unashamed joy as well. It should enable us to proclaim the gospel, the good news to all kinds of people, both Jew and non-Jew, like Paul. We should so believe in public proclamation of the gospel of Jesus that we're bold in what we say and make sacrifices and enable pro proclamation by others. This letter to the Romans, like the rest of Summerlink, should enthuse us personally to get behind mission to the nations to all kinds of people. So, are we unashamed before all kinds of people? Not simply people like me. Before whom... Might you have been ashamed of the gospel and so kept silence? Before whom might you have not shared the gospel for whatever reason? I can think of a, a few neighbours, family members, friends for whom this is true. I need to recognise my own sin here, my own idol of, of wanting to be thought well of by people rather than wanting to bring glory to God. I need to ask for forgiveness from God for this. And for his help to not be ashamed of this good news, which does save any kind of person who believes. Who might you need God's help for speaking unashamedly to? Uh, being unashamed of the gospel before others might mean simply talking about Jesus and the hope he gives us. As we chat with our neighbours about life during and after Covid, it might mean asking our colleagues why they think the world is the way it is as we discuss the latest piece of depressing news with them and go on to talk about the impact of sin in this world from somewhere like Genesis 3. It might mean thinking about people around you you've never spoken to about anything, let alone Jesus' power to save, and praying for opportunities to speak with them. It might mean joining a walk-up evangelism group with others from here who go into the squares around the city to talk about Jesus with passers-by. It might mean finishing any of those conversations with, would you like to know more about these things and maybe read through some of the Bible with me? And maybe look at some of Jesus' Jesus's teaching in his parables or his powerful miracles that give a hint of what heaven is like, a place of no sin and no sickness and no death. Those are small ways we could be unashamed. And a bit later, Joelle from Cambodia and Becky, also from London, will give us some examples of this kind of thing as well. And this is what Paul ultimately wants the Romans to do, to be unashamed of the gospel. But not just personally, but also corporately, interdependently, in partnership with others. And that's our second heading. Corporately be partners in gospel proclamation. Corporately be partners in gospel proclamation. Paul writes to these Roman followers of Jesus, of King Jesus, in the hope of eventually meeting them 
and being encouraged by them and encouraging them too. He says this in uh, chapter one, verses seven to 13, which you looked at earlier. He wants to meet them. He, he writes in verse 12. But that's not all. Let's turn to chapter 15, to the end of the letter, which you should have spent some time on as well in groups earlier. In chapter 15, verses 18 to 21, as Isaiah looked forward to, Paul tells the Romans he's preached around the Mediterranean and so hasn't made it to Rome yet. And he won't be there for a while because he's taking a gift to Jerusalem, as we see in verses 25 to 27. This is a financial gift from the Gentile churches to the Jewish churches. And it's to show mutual care between sisters and brothers who shared in God's blessings that, that came first to and, and through the Jews. But it's more than this, as we see in his other letters. And we got a hint of as we looked at Ephesians 3 together. This gift is an expression of the unity all believers have with one another in the risen Lord Jesus and shows that the wisdom and power of God in drawing people to him. We're all a new family to show the universe's powers, how great God is. In another way, chapter 16 of Romans shows this unity too, as Paul greets numerous different people by name, women and men. Jews and Gentiles, free and slave, rich and poor, all united in the risen King, Lord Jesus. All are part of the anyone who believes. Uh, but back to what he wants from the Romans in chapter 15. He wants to be helped by them in verse 24. Uh, look down at it. He writes, I hope to see you in passing as I go to, um, as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I've enjoyed your company. For a while. He says something similar in verse 28 and verse 32 as he looks for refreshment from them. But this refreshment and help is not with his packing or a bit of recuperation as he carries on his gut behind to Spain. No, he's writing this and the whole letter because he wants these Roman sisters and brothers to be fully on board on mission to the nations to help him preach where Christ is not yet known which is his ambition in verse 20. Look, look down at that. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named. He wants these ordinary Roman Christians, rich and poor, slave and free, Jew and Gentile, woman and men, to share his obligation to the wise and to the foolish so that people might be saved. Unlike some of Paul's other letters, there doesn't seem to be anything explicitly wrong with the church in Rome. He's not writing to correct them on particular points. No, rather, Paul is at a pivotal moment. He tells them and us in 15 verse 19, he's preached all the way around the east and now he wants to head west after a trip back to Jerusalem HQ. He's embarking on the next great phase of the promised gospel going out to the nations via Rome, to the ends of the earth, to Spain. And he's asking these Romans to be partners in taking the gospel to Spain, where people there are under the wrath of God. Uh, Romans is full of fantastic theology. It has a lot to say about a lot of things. But neither the Romans then nor us now can say we've understood Romans properly if we don't see Paul's big aim and in some sense join him in it. He wants his readers to be partners in gospel proclamation where Christ is not yet known. Do we understand Romans enough to have a similar ambition and concern for partnership? One US-based mission agency which helps send and support Christians live amongst Muslim people groups used to have this as its strapline, be the first, as in, be the first person to tell this particular people, Muslim people group, the good news, the momentous news that can bring them salvation through Jesus for anyone who believes. I winced a little at be the first for various reasons. I think mostly because I'm British, not American. But in some sense, it's not a bad ambition, is it? If it's for God's glory and not your own. Uh, the British missionary to China in the 19th century, Hudson Taylor, feeling the burden of many millions of people in China living and dying without hearing about Jesus, is quoted as saying, aged five, when I'm a man, I mean to be a missionary and go to China. And then as a young man, he said, I feel I cannot go on living unless I do something for China. And then later in life, as a veteran missionary to China, if I had a thousand lives, I'd give them all for China. All 
where Christ was not yet known. Another mission agency in the UK this time has as its strapline making disciples where Christ is least known. They're convinced that no one should live and die without hearing this momentous news that can bring salvation to anyone who believes. And Christ is not well known in our cities here, where there are many different people groups, as well as in rural Cambodia, where our mission partner Joel is, who we'll be hearing from later. How might they all hear about Jesus? Now, we can't literally partner with the Apostle Paul or Hudson Taylor from centuries ago, but we can with one another in small groups, in our congregations across St Helens, in prayer, in morale and in money, in this country and beyond, and bring God's glory together by together unashamedly speaking of Jesus where he's not known. How might you do that with other believers here? Who could you join with to better reach people around you? Well, chat with others about it and pray with them together. As a church, we support other churches around England trying to make disciples where Christ is not yet known. And we send and support people to other parts of the world too. We can partner with them through the church and mission partner prayer diaries. Being unashamed of the gospel isn't just a personal thing. It's a corporate thing too. When it comes to our mission partners or regional partners, we can't personally know them all, but we can still pray for them. As Paul asks for prayer from these Roman brothers and sisters he's never met. The different prayer diaries on the information board can help us with this. And partnering can also involve caring for people we're linked with, helping them on their way to Spain or wherever they're heading, giving financially, as well as actually physically joining in with their ministry and maybe suffering with them too. Is this something you can do? with maybe one or two mission partners or regional partners, maybe those you've seen at Summerlink and been particularly touched by, or maybe those your small group evening are linked with come the autumn, or maybe come to hear more um, about God's concern for the Japanese people uh, through our mission partner, Roseanne. She's having a a Saturday morning about this uh, in a couple of Saturdays time. How can we partner with her? So have a think and a prayer about this, not not just how personally you can be unashamed of the gospel before others, but how you can corporately partner with other people beyond St. Helens so that some might believe and God might be glorified. Uh, before we hear from Joelle and Becky about being unashamed and partnering among different people groups, please turn to those discussion questions um, at the end of your sheet for a few minutes. And later, as you do listen to Joelle and Becky, think about what lessons you can apply from their experience and what kind of uh, um, and look at the questions at the bottom of the sheet to help you as you watch that interview.